So, uh, so let's let's go one step back and uh, see. We will. Uh, there are many ergodic systems, uh, many systems, and now I'm going to think of them in purely mesotheoretical context. So, mobility space with some representative transformation. And you can try to analyze them or classify them up to isomorphism. And the isomorphism in this context could be just a measurable uh, bijection which intertwines the, the, the actions. So it's something which is very abstract. The underlying space, even when it is nice, might undergo uh, you know, very serious reshuffling when you try to uh, well, you know, under measurable transformations. And now, the question is, what is the classification of ergodic systems? It's a difficult question, but let's tackle it in the specific case where uh, you take SL2R um, and you look at various lattices in SL2R. Uh, so, for example, two lattices, X is G mod gamma, Y is G mod lambda. <coughs> so you can think of it as two Riemann surfaces. Uh, and your transformations are uh, E sub uh, G, or T sub A, or alpha, uh, are transformations which map a point, let's say, gamma X to, uh, yeah. whatever I write, not what I say. <coughs> Right translation. Okay. So, uh, and you can play with different elements. So, the question is do you get different things or the same thing? Okay, well, let's try to understand that. So, you can vary your lattice. So, we had two spaces to act on. They're both, I'm thinking of them, equipped with the gene variant for ability measure. Uh, and I can play with different uh, alphas. One alpha is the diagonal. Uh, matrix like this, uh, you you can vary here t, and another is something like that, and you can vary one, but it won't make any difference. So uh, two such things are conjugate to each other, and uh, it's obvious that nothing. So you can ask, is um, this thing is it conjugate, measurable conjugate to why, well, it's both of these are hard measures. Uh, and here you can take uh, another diagonal matrix. Or you can ask, uh, what about uh, Y, nu, and H? Oh. Translation by the four cyclic thing. You know, what about this? What about that? You know, these four systems, how do they relate to each other? You know, I write mu and nu, but it's the uh, same type of measure, but the transformation are different. What do we know? OK, so I, we actually know everything, but uh, we can't say that in uh, one hour. Uh, but I want to uh, show, try to show, that these systems are not isomorphic. And these systems are not isomorphic if T is not equal to S. And these are not isomorphic because this is the same thing. Now, those are going to be non-isomorphic if gamma is not equal to lambda, but this is difficult. This is Radner's theorem, little Radner's theorem, not the last. What? Little Radner so uh, the the thing that helps you do this is entropy. So uh, let, let's have a very rapid introduction to entropy. So first, uh, fix some finite set. Okay. Uh, so it's just uh, one, two, three, little a, uh, and let uh, y be the space of infinite sequences k to the n. And let s 
throughout denote the shift of this uh, transformation. It takes sequence uh, like that. So these, uh, the indices here indicate, so if y is a point in y, it is a sequence of symbols from this alphabet. And the shift just takes the sequence and shifts it, dropping the first letter. So it's a transformation which is not invertible. It's not one to one, but uh, it is a Now, this is a topological system. This is counter set with a continuous map onto itself. Uh, I, I will allow myself playing with different invariant measures. So I, I'll take mu to be some invariant measure for this. So invariant under the shift, not invariant measure. There are many of those. Let's not uh, talk about examples for the moment. But uh, here is something that you can try to compute. So given, uh, given such y and uh, nu, which is a very measure, uh, I'll look at sequence of functions i sub n from y to uh, negative reals where i sub n of a point is going to be uh, you take uh, the set of, so you look at the first n symbols of your sequence so I'll denote by y, uh, sorry, y brackets little n the finite word consisting of the first n symbols. This is an element of the n tuples of A. Uh, and you can look at uh, how many words are there which look the same as y in the first n entries. Yeah. Those, so you 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 say you know the the, the letter one three one one five. Okay, how many sequences have this beginning? Well, there are quite a few. So if y was something like this, I'm truncating it after five symbols. Look at the set of all points z which have this beginning, I can evaluate the size of that. Okay, I take the new measure of the set of sequences which agree here with y in the first n symbols. There's going to be a number less than 1, less or equal than 1. I'm interested in how fast does it decay on exponential scale. So I take the log of this. Since these numbers are small, we take minus of the log. And uh, now this is uh, what, th this was introduced by Shen a long time ago, and uh, uh, called this information, so it's information functions. I'm not going to try to justify, uh, you know, connect it to our intuition, but that's, it's the information that this measures in some way, information that we have for guessing, uh, you know, z given y, something like that, or given beginning of y. We can also talk about uh, the average value of this, h sub n. This is the integral of i n and uh, d nu. And this is the same, if you think about it, it is the same as uh, the following formula. If I take words of length n, for each such word, this is an example of that, there is the set of all those infinite words which begin like this. This is sometimes called the cylinder. So let me just write it somewhere here. Cylindrical set. So given the word W, cylindrical set uh, subset of Y. So this is collection of all things Y and Y such that Y the first n symbols is W. Okay? 
It is integral if you think about it is the following uh, solution formula. Okay. It just it's uh, now uh, here is a lemma. If I have two words W and V, uh, WV denotes the concatenation of the two. So you first write W and then you continue with V. And this gives you a word of length N plus M if M and M were the lengths. So there is an easy formula that if you run over all V's in AM and you add together the cylindrical sets like this, you get, uh, okay, uh, let me just write down something like that. This is one equation, and another equation is uh, if I What I'm trying to say is that uh, if I have two words, I, I, I decide the first three letters is this, next few letters is something else. Uh, and this determines for me cylindrical set of all the words that start that way and that way. Uh, if I run up all the possibilities of the first three letters and make that vary, then this sum is going to be equal to this. And if I do the other way around, then you will get the other. What is used in this lemma is shift invariance of the measure. But from that lemma and concavity of uh, the function minus x times log x, convexity, concavity, I'm not sure if it's one of those, you easily deduce that uh, hn plus m is less or equal than hn plus hn. So this is the fundamental uh, relationship. Uh, in in, in So it's not a big deal. It's like uh, well, we have to go fast, so I'm not giving the details of this, but you can take it as an exercise. But whenever you have a subadditive sequence, you uh, have to do the following. You have to define the quantity, which is the limit, also the same as infimum, of 1 over n hn. Because it exists, it's there, so you have to look at it. And this is called the entropy of that transformation. So this is the entropy of uh, y. What, what's crucial here is not so much y itself, but the measure that you're using to, to do this calculation. Okay. And here is a theorem that we're going to take as a black box. Uh, and it is Shannon, McMillan, uh, Ryman. Um, and it says that 1 over n i n y converges to this entropy to the normalized uh, uh, limit integral value to this number. It converges. The convergence is uh, in measure. This was Shannon uh, in L1 and uh, almost everywhere. And this is McLuhan and Bradley, I think. Yeah, it's refinements of the same phenomenon. And this is also known as equidistribution of uh, asymptotic equidistribution of uh, words or something like this. The idea is that you know, sizes of these things, they, they limit to it. Okay, now this is a, a deeper result, but it reminds you of something like ergodic theorem. It is more complicated than ergodic theorem, but it is uh, of same flavor. Things average out to the integral. Okay, well, then you go. Now, this is true if uh, nu is ergodic. So, nu is ergodic. Okay, now.
Now, these are systems of very particular nature, but you can start uh, looking at general systems. So what about general? Uh, general X, U, T. Well, can you use any of this for defining something meaningful for general ergodic system? The answer is yes, and this is known as Kolmogorov-Sinai uh, entropy. The entropy of that system is defined to be the supremum of Shannon entropies of shift transformations which are quotients, measurable quotients of y nu, sorry, of x nu t. So this was a dynamical system uh, somewhere. Well, I didn't try this. Y nu s. And if you have one dynamical system, another dynamical system, not topological, but just measurable, a quotient is a measurable map which takes this measure to that measure, but typically it's not one to one. So typically you have the phenomenon of, uh, you know, this is x u t here, and this is y nu. It's a schematic picture. So typically there is collapse of sub subsets. So it's not one to one map, but having such a quotient, uh, um, and so such a quotient is a map of measure spaces uh, such that it interpoints the, the transformations. Okay, so you look at all such possible things and take the supremum of the numbers you obtain there. Why? Well, first of all, it's nice. <coughs> Taking the supremum is nice because this is, uh, this is a number. It takes values, it can be infinite because it took supremum of finite quantities but it can be infinite. But this is a isomorphism uh, or measurable isomorphism in five. In other words, if you have x mu t and you have some other system which is the same but you, you presented it in a different way, well, every quotient of one would be also quotients of this other. So, you know, it automatically defines the inner variant. Now, the question is, uh, does every system have quotients? How to construct them and how to compute this? So if, if you start from a shift, you recover the definition? That's a good point. Yes, but you have to prove that. Because measurable maps of shift to itself, uh, you know, it's not, you can shuffle the symbols. It's actually doable, so it's even there. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you know that this captures the whole, the whole structure, or does it even I mean, it doesn't. It, okay. The Entropy is just one number. It's no, one I'm, environment. I'm talking about uh, the, the shift. You, you talk about... Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you construct this? So here, here is what... Uh, it's very... Um, I just tried to capture your attention by defining it in a weird way. But uh, the, the usual way people do it is... Uh, can I... So you, you take x, you take x, you partition it, you define a measurable partition. So you take x and write it as a disjoint union of some measurable sets. Okay, seven measurable sets. And now you take, uh, this defines you a, a, a measurable map from x to uh, the sequences on alphabet which is 1 to 7 and the map takes x and maps it to a sequence y by the rule that y i y the ith entry of y is the index so it is such that i iterate of x belongs to x y i so, okay, I wrote it in the formula. Formula is conf uh, confusing. But you just, you have your partition, let's say, into two sets. And one of them you call zero, another one. You take a point, 
you throw it in your sp you know, it is in the space. You start iterating t. It sometimes falls in the set, set zero, sometimes it falls in set one. You record the indices of the two pieces into which the iterates of x jump. Okay? This infinite sequence that you've got is the image of x under this um, under this quotient. Now, okay, well, what's good about it? The only good thing about it is that P of Px is the shift of, of the result of Px because you just shift it time by one. Now, what you do is you take mu, the measure that I allowed to vary on the shift spaces, you just take mu to be the push forward of mu, of mu under P. So, having such a quotient system is exactly the same as choosing a partition of x in the time to many sets. So, this is the traditional, but it's the same. Traditional description. Now, what I want to try to do is to explain what are the entropies of those systems. So, for g being SL2R, a as it is, the entropy of G mod gamma, it does not depend on gamma. That's the nice thing. Well, here is R. And here is the transformation by AT. This entropy is T. That's one theorem. Another theorem is that the entropy of G mod gamma R uh, th is zero. And this is pretty cool because that will immediately show you that these systems are different from those and that this is different from that if t is not equal to s. And this doesn't have to do anything with the lattices. In fact, what is true is on this level, if, if you take t to be equal to s, then this geodesic flow or geodesic time one map on G mod gamma is actually, yes, measurable as a morphic to geometric one flow on G mod lambda for you know, different gums and lambdas. But this is very difficult. This is Bornstein's theory, or consequence of Bornstein, it's a work of Bornstein and Weiss. But for Horocyclic flows, what turns out is that those two things are measurable isomorphic only if gamma is conjugate to lambda and then the isomorphism is actually algebraic. This is the theorem of Radha, little theorem of famous Radha. Okay, uh, but I'm not going there, but maybe Manfred will get somewhere close. Now, second theorem, here is a cheat. It's easy. It's easy if you know that the entropy is finite. Let's take it that it's finite. Why? Because H being 1, S, 0, 1 is conjugate <coughs> to, uh, it's con if you conjugate by a appropriate thing, namely, uh, you take here, this, Okay, let me not write. Uh, it is conjugate to, there exists A such that um, it is uh, conjugate to its own square. Um, and now, no, I see that I'm pretty hopeless in time now. Um, and what, and the entropy has funny property that uh, it is, uh, if you have a transformation and you compute it to its entropy, then the square of that transformation has double of that entropy. And the third power has three times that entropy. Now this is actually, you can already <coughs> deduce it from what is on the board uh, by looking at these HNs which are normalized. You know, if you, it, it's, uh, it's an exercise of not very difficult though. So if two transformations are conjugate 
like algebraically here, they are measurably isomorphic. So we have this transformation measurably isomorphic to the one with T H squared. So the entropy has to be equal to its own double, and the only solutions for that are zero and infinity. And if you exclude infinity by some reasoning, then you are done. So I need to to do the uh, the first theorem. Uh, it has two parts, the lower bound and the upper bound. Let's try to explain the lower bound. So is there a reason we should believe that the second entropy is rather zero than, than infinity? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, well, for example, it's related to the upper bound that I don't think I'm going to make time to explain. But there are, so it has to do with the fact that these elements don't go exponentially fast in the group. So to, in, in this setting, this entropy turns out to capture growth of balls in the hyperbolic plane, the ball of exponential growth of balls. Now, if you apply diagonal entries, this, this you know, you capture a lot of area. With horocyclics, you, you waste your time. And it's, it goes somewhat exponentially. So, let me not try to do that. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, so, when we're working with G mod gamma, it is this space. Now, for every little x in x, um, now, what is G? G is SL2R. Now, in SL2R, there are all those wonderful subgroups. Um, and what, I, what I'm going to try to, to find is a map. Uh, so for every point x in x, there are going to be a map phi sub x from R3 <coughs> to x. And this map is going to go like this phi sub x of, uh, now choice of letters here is uh, not perfect, u, v, w, let's say, is going to be now who is x? x itself is some um, coset of uh, uh, gamma. Now, I'll, uh, this is going to be this x, which is gamma v, times now here I can multiply by various matrices on the right, and the result is going to be an element in SL2R mod gamma, so it's going to be a point in, G, uh, in X. So the elements I want to multiply by are uh, maybe this one, uh, this one, the upper homocycle uh, diagonal and lower homocycle. There uh, are these three different uh, one-parameter subgroups emerging from the identity in SL2R. SL2R has dimension three, and these three directions are different. So, uh, for, for these subgroups. <laughs> so, applying those, uh, this is clearly a smooth map. What I try to say is that this is locally a, a diffeomorphism. So you, there exists there exist, uh, positive radius so that phi x when goes from this three-dimensional open cube into space x, it lands actually, uh, well, it, it, it's one-to-one diffeomorphic, uh, so you have a uh, V sub x, uh, an open neighborhood, open neighborhood of uh, the point little x. Okay, so I have these patches. So I have this x, and every point has little image of three-dimensional box around it. I have room only for two-dimensional pictures. It's called the covering map. And this is called covering map. Uh, well, not quite how it's covering composed with exponential or something. Well, one of them. <coughs> now, now, 
Now, if you take, so every point has this thing. Uh, and what I'm trying to say, so I fix now my alpha to be some uh, uh, e to the t over 2, e to the minus t over 2, 0, 0, so of this, and t is this t alpha transformation by this alpha on the right. And what I want to do is I want to write, there was this little box here, uh, three dimensional box. It's in bijection with Vx. There is another uh, box, and I want to think of it as uh, neighborhood of the image Tx. So this was little x, and here it is image of Tx. Okay, and I want to compare, so I want a local, so I, I want to use those as local charts and see how this transformation, what does it do in these coordinates, in these u, v, w coordinates. Turns out that this is very easy. Because what happens is that the transformation T alpha multiplies this by this matrix on the right. And you can push this matrix through by conjugating those things. And I'm going to be uh, wrong here if I do the calculation precisely, but what happens is conjugating by this on the right, I will shrink one of those. This is going to be neutral because this is the same type of element that just commutes with the alpha, and expand another one. I might have been shrinking this and expanding that. I'm, in my notes I wrote things in uh, left to right rather than right to left. And this, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the map T alpha, which takes neighborhood of that point to neighborhood of the point Px in local coordinates, is described here by maybe theta, theta x. Well, in these local coordinates, looks very simple. It takes coordinates u v. takes coordinates u, v, w and maps them to coordinates uh, e to the t u, v, e to the minus t w. Again, I might have uh, switched the order of those. Well, well this will work. Okay. So what happens on the, so theta x looks like this. It is a three-dimensional picture. So the, the dimension which goes this way is the middle dimension, this is V. And that doesn't change. But in, in this direction, you have uh, shrinking in one coordinate and expansion in the other. And then the rest is the same. Now, there is some kind of compactness thing and, uh, uh, you know, every point have these neighborhoods and uh, transformation T has this expansion contraction. I can find some delta positive by a kind of Lebesgue lemma argument or something, such that if I look at the minus delta to delta, things, really, really small boxes, then each of those boxes under T alpha, well, it's going to get longer, but it will still be short under single iteration of T. So it will land in the image of minus delta to delta of the, okay? I, I can control those things, so let's not worry about the local diffeomorphism thing. You can find delta, which is going to work for all of them. So I, I have good boxes around all points. And I'll work with even smaller ones. And the guarantee for the small ones would be that even this was supposed to be green. Um, 
the, uh, the, uh, the, the point was that under T it gets a little longer and narrow in some places, but still within the delta, within the once and forever controlled environment. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, local analysis would uh, work fine for us. Okay. Uh, now what I want to do is I want to show this is enough, I claim, to show that this computation uh, suffices to show that the entropy of G mod gamma R T A T is at least T, so the low bound. How? I need to choose some. I, I you know, to show that the supremum of something is at least T, I need to exhibit one of those things which has this uh, uh, little end being uh, T. So I'm going to choose some partition uh, and we'll uh, compute this quotient. So if you choose some partition X of uh, uh, this A has nothing to do with that A or that A. But, uh, so you, you take uh, a partition where a diameter of where each xi is contained in the image of my standard blocks. Okay, so sufficiently small partition so that I won't worry about things. Okay? So it's an xi partition. Yes. And I want to, so this defines this defines a quotient map from X to the shift space. Uh, so it is a covariant quotient map to the shift space. And I'm going to look at the push forward measure and compute its little m. Little m. Now what is it? What is it? What is I n or H n one? Well, so if y is y one, y two, and so on, y n and so on, then uh, you are trying to look at the size of the new size of the set of all sequences which agree with y for the first n symbols. Now, if you think about it, it is the new measure of the set which consists of uh, taking x, uh, y1, intersecting it with t minus 1, x, y2, intersecting it with t minus n, x, well, whatever, some less, some in. Oh, it's uh, regular parameters. Why? Because the new measure of such sequences is the new measure of the preimage. Who is in the preimage? In the preimage are those points which got the name y1, y2, yn under the shift. What does it mean? These are those points <coughs> which themselves lived in the, that part of the partition. Under T, they went to that piece of the partition, and so on. Uh, and uh, well, that means that them themselves were in this intersection. Now, I need to calculate this measure of that thing. In fact, what I'm interested in is the minus log of that measure. Okay. 
But well, actually, what I'm interested in is minus 1 over n of that law. I might even want to integrate that result. This is going to be hn, 1 over hn, right? That, that's what I want. But now, mu is the hard measure on, uh, on that space SL2 mod gamma. Now, those phi axes were local diffeomorphisms. Now, locally, they, the Jacobians are bounded by some constant. Again, there is a Lebesgue number, so I could have, I worked with finitely many blocks that covered everything. Each one of them allows me to compute the R measure using the Lebesgue three-dimensional measure on R3, or rather on that box. It's the same thing up to some distortion, which is bounded by a constant. So I can just compute this. So this is the same as up to a constant. So it is at least, it's greater or equal than uh, the Lebesgue measure of that intersection, well, minus log of, uh, there is one, one over n in front of this, and here, I can do the calculation with the bed measure of uh, phi, phi uh, x1 inverse. OK, let me not try to write it down, because this is going to be messy. But rather, instead, I'm trying to say I'm going to use the usual integration in the uh, UVW coordinates that are uh, lost from the board by now, uh, with the price that I'm paying some constant because the, the, there is a distortion between the measures, but it is bounded. OK. With 1 over n, this, this thing is going to disappear. So I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is the actual the back measure of uh, the minus the x of this. But here you remember, what does it mean? I'm looking at the collection of points which are under pre-image. So this is maybe, this is t, but this is uh, better understood in terms of theta, right? The local coordinate charge, uh, charts. If you, uh, if you think about it, those points which come as pre-images of this, they have to be very, very close to each other in terms of the direction which was expanded. Other directions will be fine or not fine, I don't know. But here, definitely, this direction, which was expanded by the factor e to the t, if, if you want to stay together after one iteration, you had to be e to the minus t times some fixed width together originally. And if you want to stay together for n iterates, you have to be e to the minus n times t close in that expanding direction. Okay. With the other directions, I don't know. But what I am trying to do, I'm looking at the lower estimate. In, in the lower estimate, the, uh, I already know that the, this pre-image is uh, contained in the ball of radius e to the minus n t some constant, maybe I'll call it epsilon, e to the nt epsilon times, OK, the other two coordinates, I don't, don't know it, but, and don't care. The Lebesgue measure of this is less or equal than constant times e to the minus nt. Minus log of that is greater or equal than nt. You divide by n, you get t. And there was some little noise that got gets. So the moral of this story is that the entropy that you pick is at least as uh, big as the exponential amount of shrinkage in some subspace. Here it was one, you know, the shrinking direction was one dimensional, so it's rather easy. Okay. For the upper bounds, I don't think I'll uh, manage to do it right away. But 
I want to, uh, to have time to explain two things. One is uh, <coughs> notion of topological entropy. So Kolmogorov Sinai entropy comes from looking at measurable portions which are shift spaces and computing how um, Oh, sorry, I, uh, do I have, no, I don't have Shannon Macron Bryman theorem on the board. But uh, I'll write some corollary of that. Corollary of Shannon Macron and Bryman. In fact, this corollary is of Shannon alone. It's the corollary of the effect of convergence in measure. It says the following. So the entropy, usually entropy is denoted by h, little h. Uh, so let's do it now. So let's take, it is this number such that, so it is number with the following property. For every positive epsilon there exists at n0 such that for n greater than n0, <coughs> There exists a subset omega of words of length n with the total number of words being less than e to the h plus epsilon n such that the measure of the union, this union is actually this joint, of the cylinders with these words is bigger than 1 minus epsilon. So if you are trying, you have a shift space, and on the shift space, uh, you have all kinds of words. You know, you have the infinite sequences of digits appear. And there you are trying to find, you know, what, what, what words of length n appear. It is quite often that all of them appear. But some are more likely and some are less. Question is, if I have if I need to transmit this information, you know, to the Mars uh, rover, and I need to uh, sacrifice some of the, you know, long passages in, in, in the message which don't appear often, if I'm willing to sacrifice a little bit of, uh, of the mass, uh, what is the most efficient way of compressing it? How many words do I need to cover most of the possibilities? turns out that the growth of uh, this amount of words that you need is exactly entropy both when you allow yourself errors. So trying to say that this is a corollary of Shannon's uh, theorem because uh, you just uh, um, you just grab those words which are the heaviest. You take the first e to the h plus epsilon n words whose individual, whose cylinders, uh, have greatest mass. We know that the size of a new size of the cylinders typically converge or converge in measure to, uh, well, minus log of that converges to uh, minus 1 of n, log of that converges to h. So it means that these cylinders will be at least uh, the, the weight is going to be like minus hn heavy or minus so for a typical thing this is what happens so you take all of those which uh, satisfy this and there are going to be no more than this amount of them I, I should have added epsilon somewhere there so this is a uh, consequence and this gives you the flavor of why uh, this concept of entropy was so Important. Now I'm going to move to logical entropy in five minutes. And in this setting, you don't have a measure, but you have a topological dynamical system. So your underlying space X is a compact retractable <coughs> space, uh, and T is a continuous transformation. And instead of looking at 
shift spaces which are quotients, you are trying to look at covers by shift spaces. Something like this. Or instead of measurable partitions, you are trying to look at open covers. So let's just do uh, phrase things in that language. Given a cover, an open cover, U, so it's a collection of open sets, of X define uh, well the count of U or maybe N of U to be uh, <coughs> the minimal cardinality uh, of a subcover minimal N such that there exists U1, U, N, U, uh, covering the whole space. If you have two, by, by compactness, this number is always finite. I have two covers, uh, two covers, right? These are not coverings, but covers. So this is by sets. This is script U, this is script V. Each of those consists of U's, regular U's and V's. The join is the collection of all intersections where U is in U and V is in V. And T minus 1 U is the collection of all sets T minus 1 you were using. So these definitions make sense. It takes a few minutes to absorb them. But because this is continuous, this, these are still open covers. Now, what easily shows, it is easy to show, that if you take uh, join of two things, Cover X by this many elements from U and this element elements from V, then just taking all the pairs, you will still, and intersecting the pairs, you will as efficiently, or oh, you, you will cover this efficiently X. And this number might be even smaller. So it's a semi-dativity thing. It's also easy to see that this is less equal than N of U. I mean, you want to say it's equal, but uh, if t is not invertible, maybe it's uh, Well, what's the next thing to do? Of course, you define little entropy of u to be uh, the limit of the infimum of 1 over n, n of u minus 1. Because this is a sub oh no, well, that's right. Because this is a subadditive sequence and that's what they are good for. They're one of n minutes. And the topological entropy of a system is defined to be the supremum of those uh, where you run a whole cover. And now there is a thing that has to be proven. Now this was introduced later, but this is easier to uh, concept, you know, understand, I think, than the other entropy. Uh, here is a theorem. It's part of what's called variational principle. Or maybe let me do the variational principle itself. That the supremum over all, so xt is the dynamical system. Supremum over all invariant or maybe regarding, it doesn't matter here, uh, measures 
of the homomorphs nigh entropies is exactly the topological entropy of X here. And the supremum is not always attained, sometimes it is. But this inequality, it's not a difficult theorem. But this inequality uh, is what I wanted to use, and I have a few more minutes. Um, and the idea was to check that this topological entropy for the transformation that we're interested in is also T. Okay, so there is only one thing that I want to add, and this is really a, a crucial lemma, one kind of very clever lemma, uh, that is also needed to, be a, to, to show that the little entropy for the shift space is equal to the converse entropy. This is the following uh, fact for me to, that's promoted to a proposition. Uh, given some size L and epsilon, there exists delta such that if you have uh, x mu t and two uh, shifts, uh, shift spaces as images. Well, the shift space itself is meant to be just, uh, oh, I usually call this little a. It's going to be the same thing, the same shift, but the measures might be different. So we have one quotient that goes with one measure, another quotient then that comes with another measure. Well, equivalently, if you have two partitions of x in the same number of partition elements, and you assume that the, uh, that for every i in 1 to a, the size of the basic, uh, the new size of the basic cylinder is different from the size of the, at the size of the basic cylinder by less than delta, then the resulting entropies are uh, no more than epsilon apart. So this is the main tool needed for approximating things. Or in language of partitions, if you have two partitions and they they almost coincide, the symmetric differences of the two of, of, of the basic sets are less than delta apart, then the entropies that you get are not far from each other. Now you can deduce that there are many ways of doing it. Firstly, in developing no entropy, there are these formulas which each of them is slipped, but it's a combination of long strings of those which brings you this. But you can actually deduce it from shannon lafour and Bryman, or from, uh, from that corollary of shannon lafour that I showed. Something is fine. There's no x in the conclusion. Yeah. So x tells of y can be? No. These have to be measures which come from the same thing. Right? The coupling is close to the variable. It, it's the shift transformations. So, this condition is conditioned on the first letters, but we want some consistency measure preserving. It's the coupling. So uh, th this is a, a basic lemma that uh, needs to be proven. And uh, once you know that, uh, uh, that gives you the handle for uh, a lot of those computations, because you can adjust your partitions. And, one of the things in which can be used is to prove the inequality in this. Thanks, I'll stop here. So, this was Alex's last lecture, I think. It means that you should ask questions now. Or shall I for a question? Okay.
or else you could just take more time to thank him even more by giving so many such collections.